What if, in conversations with your friends, you were always able to come up with exactly what you wanted to say? Or with colleagues, in difficult conversations, you could respond fluently? Or in politics, instead of being in constant conflict, you could create collaboration that led to a way forward? That's the possibility and the promise of applied improvisation. Some years ago, my brother asked me to go to an improvised comedy show with him. And I said, no. <laughs> I'd written some sketches, and I knew that a good performance had to be scripted, rehearsed, and directed. But he insisted, and I trusted my brother. So I went along, and we saw Jim Sweeney, Steve Steen, and a group of actors do an improvised comedy show. And it was very funny, and I was impressed. But I was working as a journalist, and I was suspicious, skeptical, and cynical. <laughs> and I thought, clearly, it was funny, but not improvised. So I went to see the show again, a week later. And once more, they did a very funny show, made up seemingly on the spot, and most impressively, based on audience suggestions. I wrote a suggestion, a friend of mine wrote a suggestion, and they used that in the sketches during the evening. So this really challenged my thinking. And being curious as a journalist, I used my license to go and interview Jim and Steve. And they told me that, indeed, there was no trick to this. It was possible to improvise fluent, attractive, energized, topical shows by using two very simple techniques. And they told me what they were. They said, you say, yes, and, and. Yes, and. And that's all there was to it. Well, this really challenged my thinking. And they said, well, if you want to know more about it, you can read some books. And there's a great book by Keith Johnston called Impro. And I picked this book up, and it's a terrific read. And later, I was able to interview Keith. And I remember he told me, you have two choices in life. You can say no and be rewarded with safety. Or you can say yes and be rewarded with adventure. It turned out that there were some other writers on improvisation as well. There's Augusto Boal, who some of you may know from Forum Theatre, who worked out that you could involve spectators in the action of a play, get them involved to change the script and lead to profound political change. And there was Viola Spolin, an American educator, who knew that play was important. And she invented playtime for American primary schools, which previously hadn't had them. A chance for children to work together where mistakes could be made in safety and they could build themselves social skills. This is a lesson that's been forgotten by some London boroughs. No games to be played in these gardens. And the bit I like most, thank you. So, what was I to do with this challenging idea that things could be made up on the spot? I decided I'd have a go, and I joined a workshop in London run by the American comedian Kit Hollaback, and found out a bit more of the inner workings of this yes and and, how it was important to support your colleague who was on stage, how it was important to keep a scene on track by adding and building to it. And then I went wild. I set up my own group and began to work with a whole range of performers developing and putting on these improvised comedy shows to the public. It struck me that these were real skills for life. And I joined the BBC as a comedy producer and was able to work with some great improvisers like Paul Merton. He has that gift of stating the obvious 
the thing that everybody else is thinking and nobody else dares say. And Josie Lawrence, who will accept whatever offer is given to her and transform it into a beautiful flowing scene on the spot and in the moment. I recruited people for my comedy groups, such as Rob Bryden, who you see here. He would host the shows and invite the audience to engage in dialogue, which would then be the basis of a scene. We had Ian Morris, the guy who then went on to co-write and co-produce The Inbetweeners, one of the most successful British comedy TV series and British comedy films of the last 10 years. And Ruth Jones, who co-wrote and co-starred in the sitcom Gavin and Stacey. And these people used the techniques they learnt in the improvisation group to apply to creating character and preparing scripts, which would then be recorded and filmed. The next step was realising that these were not just skills for the stage, but skills for life. And I started to teach improvisation skills in organisations, taking presentation skills to companies such as Procter & Gamble and Grant Thornton, where instead of giving a boring presentation based around bullet points, the speakers would have dialogue, talk to the audience, clearly state simple messages, and tell personal stories that matter to them and to their audience. We also found that in organisations, if you took the yes and type of conversation, you could transform the atmosphere within the organisation. Typically, people think they won't take their ideas to share with their boss or their colleagues because they fear that they're going to be rejected with a big no. If instead we can encourage people to say yes and and, then the ideas have a chance to flourish, to build gradually and to grow. And there's another benefit. If people are listened to, they feel valued and appreciated, and then they're likely to come up with more ideas in the future, and you create a more collaborative atmosphere within your organisation. So I was doing this and enjoying myself, wrote a book about it, but was feeling rather isolated and lonely, wondering if anybody else was doing the same thing, until I went to a conference in Florida for trainers, and there were two other people who were doing improvisation within their workshops. And we got excited by this, and in the bar afterwards, we wondered if there were maybe some other people who were doing it. And that was the beginning of the Applied Improvisation Network. This is a network that we founded 10 years ago with conferences to see if other people would want to come and share these ideas. And now, as the president of this organisation, we have more than 2,000 people working worldwide and globally to bring ideas of improvisation into organisations and communities, prisons, all over society and all around the world. One of the areas that they're taking this into now is um, in business schools. Improvisation is on the agenda of more than half of the top 20 business schools around the world. And leaders are coming to learn skills for the future to build and create new types of organisations in which yes and can be a core part. They learn, for example, the importance of collaborating with each other and with their colleagues and how to deal with uncertainty and being more confident in a world of complexity and constant change. And these are skills that are available and useful to us all. Leaders in the past have known about conversation too. Churchill said, courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. So, how is this done? Improvisation is a skill that we all have and we all do every day. After all, life is not scripted and we have to deal with the things that come to us unexpectedly. For example, somebody comes around to dinner they haven't announced that they're coming. You look in your larder and you find out what ingredients you've got and you make something out of that. You're improvising a meal with the best of what's available to you at the time. And so it is in the rest of our lives. Let's have a go. 
I'm going to ask you two questions, and I'd like you to answer, first of all, with a no. Are you willing to join in? No. All at the same time, please. <laughs> Will you listen next time somebody comes to you with a new idea? No. Good. This time I'm going to answer with a yes. I know it's upside down, but it's improvised. Are you willing to join in? Yes. Will you listen next time somebody comes to you with a new idea? Yes. And now we're going to take that extra step, the improvisational step, into yes and. The and can be anything you want it to be. You're going to build and add to your yes answer. If you can't think of anything to say, you can say to the first question, and I'll buy you a coffee in the break. And to the second one, you can say, and I will add something of my own to the idea that I hear. <coughs> but it's up to you to say whatever you want, and we're all going to say this at the same time, so you're in complete safety and freedom to say whatever you like. Are you going to join in? Yes. <laughs> That's at least three cups of coffee I'm getting in the break. <laughs> Will you listen next time somebody comes to you with a new idea? Yes. <laughs> hmm, that should be some interesting conversations. I'm going to share with you one example of how the power of yes and goes worldwide and has the possibility of changing the way that people conduct politics. This is an example of a world cafe conversation which uses the improvisational principles of listening carefully to what everyone has to say, short turn-taking, and building on each other's ideas. And there were 1,000 tables with 10 people at each table at this event in Israel where they were designing possible futures to change the society. Now, similar events are ho happening worldwide under the art of hosting umbrella. So... What does this mean for us? What are you going to do next time your brother or your sister, one of your colleagues, comes to you with an idea that at first sounds crazy or that you just don't understand or that challenges your mainstream? I know what I'm going to say. What are you going to say? Let's hear it all together. Yes, yes. and. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>